World War I. Four years of bitter conflict. Known as the Great War. Or the war to end all wars. It's grim trench warfare. With Europe the main theatre of war. But this was a war fought on many fronts. So there's another story, rarely told, of huge importance during the war and of lasting significance. A story of troops who fought and died, but who were often forgotten. And of an outcome that shaped the Middle East of today. This is World War I through Arab eyes. Malik Tariki, the Tunisian writer and broadcaster, is taking us on a personal journey across a dozen countries. His grandfather's generation fought in the war. So far, he's explored how thousands of Arabs were conscripted by the British and French colonial powers in North Africa. and how Arabs were forced to fight on both sides for the European allies and the central powers, setting Muslim against Muslim. And the vital role played by Arab troops in the Ottoman army at Gallipoli. In this episode, he looks at the roots of why the Ottomans joined the war at all how the European powers viewed the Ottoman Empire as ripe for division and exploitation, and the suffering when the Ottoman government of young Turks cracked down on the Arab provinces, and the little-known story of a future Zionist leader in the Ottoman world. A Polish Jewish student walked along here in 1911. His name, David Ben-Gurion, who would become the first prime minister of Israel. كانت لدى العرب دوافع حقيقية للتفكير بمصيرهم بمستقبلهم بعد دخول الدولة العثمانية الحرب العالمية الأولى أولا فرضت دول الحلفاء على البلاد العربية أي آسيا العربية أنذاك فرضت عليها حصارا اقتصاديا منع الحجاج من الوصول إلى مكة بالنسبة للحجاج منعت المواد من سكر شاي قهوة زيت كل هذه زيت كاز إلى آخره التي كانت تأتي من أوروبا منع دخولها إلى هذه البلاد منع تصديرات هذه البلاد إلى الخارج ولذلك أصبحت البلاد في أزمة اقتصادية حادة في هذا الوضع أيضا قال العرب هذه الحرب لا ناقة لنا فيها ولا جمل لماذا ندخلها؟ لماذا دخلها الاتحاديون؟ A very good question, and one with roots deep in Ottoman history. Before 1830, the Ottoman Empire stretched from Mesopotamia in the east to the Red Sea and most of the North African coast. But over the next 80 or so years, the Ottomans lost Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, and in 1912, Libya. Then they lost territories much closer to home in the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913. 
So Britain, France and Russia began plotting how to exploit the potential collapse of Sultan Abdulhamid's empire for their own individual benefit. Sultan Abdulhamid II, who ruled the empire from 1876 to 1908 or 1909, felt that the Western European powers were playing dirty games. Uh, they, in his mind, uh, and in the minds of the advisors around him and many Ottoman observers, the European powers were uh, supporting uh, nationalist independence movements within the Ottoman Empire. He saw that the great powers were using religion, especially Christianity, to mobilize those nationalist movements in an effort to undermine the Ottoman Empire. The Sultan's view was not wrong. The European powers saw unrest in the Arab world after nearly 400 years of Ottoman rule as an opportunity. But there was a stumbling block. Provincial Arab leaders and intellectuals were thinking about gaining independence from the Ottomans. But for ordinary Arabs, the Sultan in Istanbul was the Caliph of Islam, the leader of the Muslim world. Whichever side you were on, there was a close bond with the Caliph, respect and loyalty for him across the Arab world. An incident later in the war illustrated this clearly. The British captured 700 Iraqi soldiers in 1917 and sent them to Egypt. The British offered to free the prisoners if they'd support an Arab revolt against the Ottomans, led by Sharif Hussein of Mecca. But few Iraqis accepted. Most were uneasy at the idea of challenging the caliph. Books such as the 1938 work by George Antonius, The Arab Revolt, uh, exaggerated the support of Sharif Hussein's 1916 uh, revolt against the Ottomans and exaggerated and painted a very uh, negative uh, image of Ottoman rule, of 400 years of Ottoman rule. Um, and even many uh, European colonialists tended to uh, denigrate the Ottoman past and to the point of referring to it as so despotic and uh, backward that it almost welcomed uh, the arrival of European colonialism. The Ottoman army was also diverse. In November 1914, up to 300,000 of their troops were Arabs from greater Syria. Of the army's nine most senior commanders, two were Albanian, two from the Caucasus, and two Arab. And in politics, Said Khalim Pasha, the Grand Vizier, or Prime Minister, was from Egypt. The British had to find a way to challenge this holy bond between the Caliph in Istanbul and his loyal Arab Muslim citizens. They approached Hussein bin Ali, the Sharif of Mecca. He was a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, leader of the Hashemite people and ruler of Islam's most holy place. The British thought he alone could challenge the caliph in Istanbul, but it would not be straightforward. On the eve of World War I, most Arabs were largely supportive of the Ottoman Empire. They regarded it as a protector of, uh, the, of an Islamic identity in an era of expanding European colonialism. Uh, even many Arab Christians and Jews, especially after 1908, welcomed the uh, liberal uh, reforms and uh, wrote glowingly uh, of, the, of these reforms and of this era and rarely ever called for independence for the Arab people. 1908 was a significant year in this unfolding story. That was when the new leaders of the Committee of Union and Progress, the Young Turks, staged a coup removing Sultan Abdul Hamid II from power. They started out in 1908 with a project of trying to hold the empire together on the basis of constitutional rule. But at the same time, uh, they found themselves in the position of trying to defend and maintain the empire against both great power encroachments and against new nationalist uprisings from within. When the Young Turks reconvened parliament, they created optimism in the Arab world. But this soon turned 
to disillusionment. Although they may not have intended it that way, they found themselves fighting to maintain and perpetuate empire from 1911 onwards, from Italy's invasion of Tripoli onwards, then came the Balkan Wars, and then there came the Great War. And this changed them. This transformed their initial attitude of promising and bringing freedom to the Ottoman peoples into one of maintaining empire. Defeat in the Balkans hardened the young Turks, and they tightened their grip on their Arab possessions. The Balkan Wars of 1912-13 and catastrophic defeat and final eviction from what had been the Ottoman Balkans brought about an enormous quantum jump in the development and rigidification of uh, Turkish nationalism. And also they became more and more dictatorial. The young Turks had hoped to stay out of the war and ally themselves with Britain and France. But neither of these two countries would go against Russia, so they were not an option. Besides, the Ottomans and Germany had a history of friendship. Kaiser Wilhelm II first visited Istanbul in 1889 to befriend Sultan Abdul Hamid. Nine years later, he landed at Haifa on a state visit to the Ottoman East. He made a ceremonial entry into Jerusalem. and visited the tomb in Damascus of Salah Adin, the famous medieval Muslim warrior who defeated the Crusaders. There was mass celebration when he announced that Germany would pay for the renovation of his grave. The Kaiser also declared his friendship of the world's 300 million Muslims and gained the nickname Haji Wilhelm. So Germany was a natural ally. But the young Turks were also gambling that the European war might be over quickly. At the time, uh, there were um, theories and uh, perspectives voiced in Europe that, in fact, these civilized European powers uh, would not fight each other for very long, uh, that this was a crisis, uh, but a crisis that might uh, come to an end uh, sooner rather than later. Ottoman leaders hoped that they would be able to save the alliance with Germany, uh, which they had signed for seven years. Not necessarily protection, but an alliance with Germany that would help the Ottoman state to consolidate its, uh, uh, its borders, its institutions, and to uh, re-strengthen in this period under which um, they would have Germany as an ally. However, Germany needed this deal as much as the Ottomans. They were outnumbered on the ground in Europe and could open new eastern fronts against Russia and the British. The German general Erich Ludendorff wrote that Ottoman entry into the war enabled the Central Powers to soldier on for another two years. Otherwise, the war might well have been over by 1916. This is the house in Istanbul of Anwar Pasha. He led the secret negotiations with Germany on behalf of the Young Turk or Unionist government. Here on the night of the 1st of August 1914, he secured his Treaty of Alliance. Anwar Pasha was a fan of everything German. He spoke the language, trained in military college there, and admired the way Chancellor Otto von Bismarck had modernized the state. They had enormous admiration for Prussianism, for Bismarckianism, and for the German Sonderweg. Germany had to follow its own special path, and it was envisioned as, and it became a path in which the German military, the German army, played God to the nation and the state. 
it was perceived, and it really was true to a large extent, that uh, the German nation and the German state were called forth in a very strong sense by Prussia and the Prussian army. And this is what Bismarckianism was all about. The Unionists perceived themselves as pursuing a kind of Prussian path in the context of the Ottoman Empire. And it wasn't just the young Turks who admired Germany. Some Arabs were impressed by its achievements. National unity, military expansion, scientific research, and economic development. The Lebanese writer Suleiman Tharia wrote a poem called A 20th Century War. In August 1914, Anwar Pasha's treaty was still a secret. But in the second week of November came the formal Ottoman entry into the war. And the Grand Mufti's call for Muslims to join a jihad against the Entente powers here at Al Fatah Mosque in Istanbul. <laughs> It was a call for a holy war to all Muslims, including Arabs who supported the caliph. The Germans believed that this call could undermine their enemy's war efforts. There were millions of Muslims in the British and French colonies where the Germans hoped for mass uprisings. They launched a campaign to influence Muslims fighting for the Allies. It was led by German lawyer, diplomat, and ancient historian, Max von Oppenheim. It was obviously very dear to his heart because of his German patriotism and so on, um, and his interest in the Middle East. But in a very specific way, by 1899, Oppenheim was known, had a reputation as an experienced and really very well-informed traveler. Oppenheim was an adventurer and archaeologist, but was also involved in planning the route of the Berlin to Baghdad railway. The German government wanted to build the line to compete with the British, to give them access to oil and bring the region under stronger German influence. Nothing unusual about the fact that Siemens, who was then the director of the Deutsche Bank, which was largely in in charge of the financing of the Berlin to Baghdad Railway, should contact him about the extension of the line from Aleppo to Mosul, as far as that particular stretch. And he asked him if he would do some prospecting and advise them on what was the best route. And uh, he wrote about all the advantages, the, the best and most efficient line to follow for the railroad and all the advantages that would accrue from following this route rather than that route and so on. After troubleshooting for Siemens and Deutsche Bank, he'd made a historic archeological discovery in northern Syria in 1899, Tel Khalaf. It was in a certain sense by accident that he made the greatest discovery of his career, that he discovered Tel Halaf. Uh, because really what he was trying to do was do this prospecting on his own, uh, unofficially, for the Berlin to Baghdad Railway. And he did, write, he did write a Bericht, a report, and devoted many more pages of that report to route from Aleppo to Mosul than he did uh, uh, to the, what he had discovered at Tel Halaf. Oppenheim returned to excavate Tel Halaf in 1911 and discovered a city built in 6000 BC. The Berlin to Baghdad railway took 37 years to complete, by which time Europe would be at war again. 
that's still to come. The devastating impact of the war on Greater Syria and its people. When we think about World War I, we think about the British and the French and the Germans. But really, the Ottoman Empire suffered far more than any of the continental powers. The terrible effects of the Ottoman repression of Arab nationalists. <laughs> and a modern Greek city, and its story of one of the founders of Israel. During centuries of Ottoman rule, this was mainly a Jewish city. It was called the Jerusalem of the Balkans. Malik Turiki, the Tunisian writer and broadcaster, is looking at the Ottomans' role in the First World War. When Istanbul entered the war in mid-November 1914, Arab troops were forced to fight on both sides. For the Ottomans, and as conscripts for the European allies occupying Egypt, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, hundreds of thousands died. Egypt was still technically part of the Ottoman Empire, but had been under British occupation since 1882. When the Ottomans entered the war, Britain declared a protectorate over Egypt. The most populous Arab country offered Britain 1,200,000 recruits in different roles during the war across three continents. 500,000 of them died. Ordinary Arab people knew this war had little to do with them, but were caught up in it. The Jordanian capital, Amman, was then in greater Syria. Malik went in search of what happened there. Was Sharif Hussein بعث برقية عندما أعلنت الحرب مباشرة إلى الصدر الأعظم يرجوه أن يعيد النظر في الموضوع وألا يعلن الحرب لأنها ستكون وبالا على البلاد العربية جميعا وعلى الدولة العثمانية وأن الاختيار بدخول هذه الحرب خطر كبير على الدولة. And Sharif Hussein was proved right. The young Turk government appointed Jamal Pasha as governor of Greater Syria. He acted ruthlessly against anyone suspected of Arab nationalist sympathies. His nickname was Al Safar, the Bloodshedder. After the announcement of the war, in 10 days, the Turkish government sent Ahmed Jamal Pasha to the country of the Sham. He was at the time the minister of the Bahrain. وكانت مهمته أن يقود حملة عسكرية لتحرير مصر من الاحتلال البريطاني. In late January 1915, Jamal Pasha marched Ottoman troops from Greater Syria into the Sinai Peninsula. In February, they tried to cross the Suez Canal east to west, but the British troops guarding the canal repelled the attack, and the Ottomans withdrew. بنوا ثلاثة جسور لم ينجح منها إلا جسر واحد نزل فيه حوالي 600 جندي معظمهم من العرب ألقى القبض عليهم الإنجليز بالطرف الآخر من القناة ولم يجروا بعد ذلك إلى إرسال قوات أخرى As Jamal Pasha and the Ottomans faced defeat at Suez Sharif Hussein's revolt was gaining momentum the British had promised Hussein and his family future control over a greater Arab state in present-day Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and Jordan. كان لا بد لجمال باشا من أن يجد صيغة أيضا لتبريرها. فقال أن العرب لم يسمحوا لي وخاصة هؤلاء المتقفون لم يسمحوا لي 
او متاثرين بالدعايه للشريف حسين الذي اعتبره خائنا لانه تمرد على الدوله العثمانيه انذاك وهذا وهكذا بدا بمتابعه التحقيق مع المثقفين العرب من بلاد الشام بوجه عام حوكموا واول وجبه كانت احد عشر شابا مثقفا قدموا للمشانق وشنقوا في بيروت ثم تبعهم الموجه الثانيه 21 شاب ايضا اعدموا في دمشق During 1915, Jamal Pasha condemned dozens to death in Beirut and Damascus. He sentenced hundreds to long jail terms and sent thousands more into exile. مرحلة جمال باشا مرحلة مظلمة في تاريخنا. المجاعة، الشنق، الجواسيس، التجويع، الفساد، التآمر، المشانق مش بس بالساحة المزة وساعة الشهداء ببيروت البرج أيضا بحيفا كمان بزيت الوقت يعني قتلوا الانتليجنس العربية. But the war did not just affect Arab nationalists. Thousands of men were conscripted. Crops and livestock were requisitioned. Arabs suffered disastrously in Egypt, Iraq, and Bilad Asham. Greater Syria. We, you know, when we think about World War One, we think about the Western Front and the trenches and the British and the French and the Germans. Uh, but really, the Ottoman Empire suffered far more than any of the continental powers. About nine percent of the uh, German population died. About 11 percent of the French population died. But anywhere from between 14 percent and 25 percent of the Ottoman population died. أصلاً بكل لبنان تلت السكان ماتوا من المجاعة تلت السكان ماتوا وتلت شرحتوا وانتقلوا وتهجروا ها يعني أصبح هناك كارثة ديموغرافية على لبنان يعني قرية في قرى بكاملها عندي تقارير قرى بكاملها اندثرت بيتنا نحن بيتنا انهد بالحرب ووالدي انتقل إلى بيت آخر في سبب آخر للمجاعة أيضاً إنه المهاجرين كانوا يبعثوا أموال لأهلهم في الجبل جدي كان يبعث لوالدي خلال الحرب ما عادت الرسائل توصل يعني عندك خلل بالإنتاج الزراعي خلل بالمواصلات خلل بال بوسائل النقل وسائل النقل خلل باستيراد من مجيء المساعدات من المهاجرين كيف بدوا يعيشوا الناس المجاعة هيدا إطارة والمجاعة خطيرة جدا نتائجها على الناس يعني عائلات بأكملها أولاد نساء نساء تبيع عفافة بأكل ناس رهنوا أراضيهم بالحرب مقابل حفنة من الحبوب عندي قصص إذا بدك أقري لك إياها أخ يعني اللي شهود عيان مرعبة بالمجاعة فهي حفرت في الذاكرة الجماعية للسكان وما فينا نشيلها. Maimouna Alamin is Lebanese. She's over a hundred years old. The war also left its mark on her. She still remembers how men used to hide or even dress up as women to avoid conscription. But her most painful memory is of the terrible famine. You are active. جوع كتير لما اجوا اهل الجبال واهل الدنيا هاي من الجوع يشيلوا الحلقات من دين ايون يبيعوهن بروحها تطحين هالقد هالقد ها هالقد يجيبوا زعتر زعتر برا يكتوه 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 او يحطوا هالقد تطحين يبيعوها يحبنوا الرصوص الرصوص هيك على الثوج هيك شفتم بها العين هيك لجوك يا دبلة but famine was not the only horror the war inflicted on the Arab world. 
Let's start with Mesopotamia, or Iraq, with the arrival of 600,000 Indian colonial soldiers. Mm -hmm. So with these soldiers coming in from Bombay, for example, to other port cities, they're all carrying diseases, typhus, cholera, dysentery, something called a wasting fever, which was devastating, could lead to seizures and coma. What a lot of people suffered without ever having gone to the front was contagion and the casualty rate from epidemic is much higher than the casualty rate for being at the front. Um, but the front paid, played a role, um, especially as refugees fled from the front in Mesopotamia and in the Caucasus in particular, they brought with them the lice and the fleas, and lice, of course, carry typhus. Um, and malaria was also a concern. On the battlefield, however, and to the surprise of the European powers, the Ottomans proved a valuable German ally. They'd attacked the British at the Suez Canal, defeated the Allies at Gallipoli in 1915. They forced the surrender of the Indian Expeditionary Force in Mesopotamia in 1916. They contained Sharif Hussein's Arab revolt along the Hejaz railway line. And they forced the British to fight every step of the way in Palestine in 1918. But Ottoman military commanders also committed catastrophic errors. Minister for War and government leader Anwar Pasha sent tens of thousands of soldiers to fight the Russians at Sarakamish in eastern Anatolia during the winter of 1914 and early 1915. He wanted to regain territory lost to Russia in 1878. Few of his troops had proper weapons or even boots to march in. As many as 60,000 Ottoman troops died, of whom two-thirds are likely to have perished from frostbite and typhus, rather than fighting the Russians. The disaster at Sarakamish is still marked by local people. Prayers are said every Friday for the third Ottoman army. Some of the older members of the community, like this village elder, recall a popular poem from that time. It accuses Anwar Pasha of betraying his own men, a betrayal, they say, that bordered on treason. Anwar Pasha blamed the defeat on Armenians, who he claimed had sided with the Russians. In April 1915, the government rounded up 250 Armenian intellectuals and community leaders in Istanbul. Armenian men were killed and army conscripts put into labor battalions. Women children and the elderly were deported and forced onto long marches into the Syrian desert. The facts are still hard to agree on, but some historians believe that the young Turk government, the Unionists, forced up to a million and a half Armenians from their homes, and that as many as 800,000 died. Already, at the time of the Sarikamish campaign, uh, we have Enver cabling Talats in Istanbul, his trusted second in charge and interior minister. The Russians are uh, pushing out all these Muslim populations from Caucasia towards our lines and they are causing disruption to our war effort. Do you think we should, in turn, we should be exiling our Armenians into uh, Russian territories so as to, you know, in revenge and in, you know, in order to cause a similar degree of economic and administrative disruption. Talat says, no, let's, let's think about this a bit. 
in time this germinal idea will be converted into mass Armenian deportations towards the Arab uh, territories, towards the Arabian South. And Armenian soldiers in Ottoman uniform are separated into forced labor battalions. But the idea has firmly arisen that the Armenians have become a totally unreliable, hostile population. It seems that Amer and Talat, more than Jamal, reason among themselves that they are a non-reliable, potentially treacherous population, and let's not wait for it to happen. This time, let's act first, and let's undertake massive preemptive measures. A hundred years on, these events are still a matter of debate. But one of the lasting effects of the Armenian exodus to the Arabian South has been the racial diversity it brought to the region. In the 21st century, their descendants are now part of the Levant's rich social fabric in areas like Burj Hamoud in Beirut. <laughs> اللي كان واحد منهم واهم بقي لحديد هلا وصار منطقه كثير مهم حضاريا المنطقه كلها مؤسس على ذكريات القديمه فالشوارع هون مثلا هذا الشارع مسمى شارع مراش مراش هو المنطقه او المدينه اللي هاجروا من هناك فهدول كلهم اللي كانوا من هناك جمعوا بعض على بعض واسسوا هذا الشارع Ethnic diversity has also characterized this city in the northeast of the Ottoman Empire in the early 1900s. Thessaloniki, Salonika, in modern Greece. After their expulsion along with the Muslims from Andalusia, southern Spain in 1492, Sephardic Jews found refuge here in Salonika. During centuries of Ottoman rule, this was mainly a Jewish city. It was called the Jerusalem of the Balkans. Salonika was one of the cities that benefited from a series of Ottoman reforms in the mid-19th century. These included equality with Muslims for both Jews and Christians. The nationalist leader of modern Turkey, Mustafa Kemal, was born and raised in this house. It's now a Turkish museum. The story of Ataturk as the founder of modern Turkey is often told. Less well known is Salonika's part in the life of another nationalist leader, one who would change the map of the Middle East. A Polish Jewish student uh, walked along here in 1911. He wore a fez like any other Ottoman citizen. He was here to learn Ottoman Turkish before going on to study law at the University of Istanbul. His name, David Ben Gurion, who would become the first Prime Minister of Israel. <laughs> Ben-Gurion was a student in Salonika and Istanbul. He actively supported the Ottoman army and encouraged around 40 Jews to join a pro-government militia in Jerusalem. He visited America to drum up support for the Ottoman Empire. Traveling via Egypt, Ben-Gurion toured 35 US cities and hoped to recruit some 10,000 men in support of the Ottoman cause. But he failed, and a major British military advance changed his loyalties. In August 1916, the British went on the offensive against the Ottomans in Suez under General Edmund Alamey. By early 1917, 
they'd removed the Ottomans from the Sinai Peninsula and continued their march towards Palestine. In December, Allenby entered Jerusalem on foot out of respect for the holy city. Jamal Pasha, the bloodshedder of Greater Syria, was forced out. Allenby pressed on to take the whole of the Levant and force a complete Ottoman retreat. The signing of the Armistice of Mudros took place on the 30th of October 1918. A month later, the whole war was over. Once Jerusalem fell, David Ben-Gurion joined a Jewish regiment of the British Army in London before returning to Palestine to pursue his political career. Ben-Gurion's story typifies how the war presented opportunity. It wasn't so much the speed at which he transferred his allegiance, it was more that he recognized that a time of radical and far-reaching change was dawning in the region. A new world order was about to take shape, and he wanted to be one of its architects. The First World War gave birth to three nationalist movements, Turkish, Zionist and Arab. And the relationship between the Turks and Arabs changed forever as four centuries of Ottoman rule were ended by four years of conflict. The awakening of consciousness that grew out of this shift in power was a foretaste of the Arab nationalism that was to come. In the next episode, Britain's contradictory promises that proved impossible to deliver. The secret agreement between Britain and France that carved up the Middle East for generations. They assumed that these peoples couldn't possibly believe that when the British and the French talked of national freedom, that it actually meant political independence. The hopes of that independence that were ignited by the war. And the crushing disappointment as these hopes were dashed by colonial self-interest. للأسف يعني بيحزن إنه نشوف إلى ماذا آلت الحال في الدول العربية. In the final episode of World War One through Arab eyes.